Good morning, folks. We're, we're here this morning in Houston at the 2017 STS. I'm Tom Gleason from the University of Pittsburgh. To my far right, David Pacini from Bologna, Chad Hughes from Duke, and Himanshu Patel from University of Michigan. Here to talk about the state of the union uh, with respect to type B aortic dissection in the acute setting. I wanted to open the discussion to, uh, starting with indications for intervention. Uh, it's a moving target. There's a lot of crosstalk between Europe and the United States in this arena, which has been very exciting. So, David, at this point, what does your institution uh, use as an algorithm for intervention uh, in the setting of acute type B dissection? Okay, yeah. Uh, we are not so much aggressive as uh, other centers in Europe. We still uh, indicate uh, uh, a TIVAR treatment in uh, uh, acute type aortic dissection in case of complication. And it's the, 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 the most difficult uh, uh, um, situation is uh, to, uh, to understand which uh, are the, mo the complicated type B dissection. I mean, uh, uh, usually complicated type B dissection are uh, malperfused uh, or with uh, a sign of impending rupture, with uh, uh, uncontrollable pain, or uh, even uh, with uh, uncontrollable hypertension. So we, we treat this kind of patient, but uh, uh, in case of uh, sign, uh, um, radiological sign of malperfusion, I mean that uh, there are on the CT scan that uh, you can see some kind of uh, visceral malperfusion, I mean a compressed uh, true lumen. So in this case, uh, we don't wait so long to treat this, uh, these patients. Chad, do you, do you uh, find that intervention for pseudocorrectation or true lumen compression uh, is, a, is now an indication to intervene? Or, or at what point would you consider those patients, even, if, even in the absence of clinical malperfusion? Yeah, I, mean, I think that's a great question. I mean, the patient with a uh, very compressed true lumen who certainly has difficulty controlling their blood pressure, I think that, you know, that, that is renal malperfusion. Those patients should be intervened. Um, you know, I think it gets a little uh, tricky when, when it's uh, a radiographic only with no clinical sequela. Um, and in those patients, um, we may wait. Um, you know, there, as you're well aware, there's some data from the Virtue Registry out of Europe that, uh, you know, treating in the two to two week to 90 day subacute phase may be a little bit um, fewer complications, uh, retrograde dissection being a big one than treating in the first two weeks. So if the patient does not have clinical malperfusion, just radiographic, uh, that's somebody that we may uh, manage medically and do TVAR uh, in the interval subacute uh, phase rather than doing it uh, acutely. That's a good segue to timing. So Himanshu, what what timing, what do you think the optimal timing is in, in, the, in the setting of those less clinically uh, evident uh, cases versus those with uh, evident uh, malperfusion? So obviously, evident malperfusion um, should be treated right away to preserve end organ function. But in the setting of um, other soft signs, say, um, where you think uh, T-bar may be indicated, we will often try to see if we can wait on these patients for um, a week or two to allow some of the edema at the, um, at the proximal landing zone to resolve. Because part of the reason that we suspect that you have a higher incidence of, um, of retrograde type A dissection is you put a relatively stiff stent graft at the junction of a boggy aorta from inflammation um, and you have a difference in compliance in that region that sets you up for um, a, a tear at that site. So we usually try to wait a little bit if we can, a little bit meaning anywhere within the first, uh, you know, uh, after between one and four weeks if we can. To that end, uh, your point about retrograde dissection, give us some sense of your algorithm for covering, not covering the left subclavian, revascularizing the left subclavian, and device choice for those cases where you may be concerned about, uh, in particular, retrograde dissection? So um, obviously, if the, uh, if, if the, when, w what we look at is we look at the CT scan, and we generally will cover the left subclavian artery if the dissection extends to its level. We have, in the last 10 years, gone to 
a strategy of revascularizing every left subclavian artery that's covered in the event that it's, uh, it's possible to do so, so not an emergency where the patient is hemodynamically unstable. And then the other things that we look at on the CT scan are whether they've bled into the wall more proximally. And if you, if you get the sense that um, somebody may have bled a little bit into the wall more proximally, um, say in the region between the carotid and the subclavian arteries, we would wait to see um, if that resolution, or we would wait to ensure that the hematoma resolves before we place the stiff stent graft in there because of the concern of retrograde propagation of the dissection. And what about your setup, guys, with these cases? Are you, can't, are you accessing both groins on all of them, one groin? Are you accessing the left arm if you're going to revascularize? Give, Chad, give me a sense of your uh, typical uh, type B, acute type B case as far as your uh, instrumentation setup. So um, usually um, one side versus the other is going to be preferable in terms of communicating with the true lumen based on the CT scan, and that's typically the side that we would choose for the large bore access. Uh, which uh, frequently would be a cut down um, uh, percutaneous, to total percutaneous access is certainly uh, possible. We just uh, have not really adopted that uh, in our practice. Um, and then the other side would be percutaneous access. Uh, I would say early on, you know, in, in, you know, since 05 to now, you know, we've been, we have, you know, what, 12 year TVAR, 11, 12 years of, of TVAR experience. And certainly in our earlier experience doing dissection cases, we would always prep the right arm in. So if we couldn't get into the true lumen from below, we could, you know, come anti-grade on a tight begin in the true and then snare it from below. I would say that that's almost never required anymore just because with increasing experience, we can usually get into the true lumen. Uh, just uh, having dealt with a bunch of times, sometimes you may need IVIS to help negotiate it, but um, we almost never would need to go from the right arm anymore. But certainly I think people who are earlier in their experience, that may be something that they're gonna need to do. Um, if we're doing a carotid subclavian bypass, you know, we just usually do that at the beginning of the case. And like Comanche, we pretty much would revascularize almost all uh, of these folks unless they were uh, ruptured or unstable because it's going to be generally, we tend to, and we can talk about this, but we tend to prefer fairly long segment coverage even in the acute setting and uh, certainly uh, protective of the spinal cord uh, to do that. We use, uh, we, do under, we do these cases under GA. We have interop TEE on all cases uh, because we have our cardiac anesthesiologists who do our regular uh, cardiac cases and I think that's helpful for um, you know looking for retrograde dissection at the end. Uh, we use IVUS on all these cases as well uh, to uh, both confirm true lumen wire location throughout also you can get proximal landing zone uh, kind of recheck your CTA measurements and then also you can look for retrograde dissection with the IVUS uh, at the end and then also IVUS is useful after you've deployed your stent graft as kind of a pullback to make sure everything's well expanded you don't need stent graft uh, collapse so that's kind of our, our setup. So let's talk about extent of coverage for a second. So let's pull everybody in the group. Acute B uh, with subclavian coverage, what is your preferred extent distally? So our policy of, of, is, of yeah, yeah is, uh, is to cover the primary entry tier. And then we see uh, the, if there is uh, or not uh, my perfusion, if there is uh, or not uh, the domino effect uh, with re-expansion and rehabilitation of the of the re reopening of the of the vessels. Uh, so our policy is to cover the primary entry tier. With and what length graft? Uh, uh, the, the, the regular stand, stand graft, cover stand graft. Uh, we use uh, uh, um, uh, not barrel stand. Uh, and usually uh, 10 to 15 centimeters, not more. No, we cover longer. I almost always use a single, usually an acute type B complicated. If it's acute complicated, say malperfusion, which would be most, comp most common, obviously rupture, you're pretty much going to pave to the celiac every time because it's, it's difficult to know where it's leaking from. You know, there's just hematoma everywhere. It looks like a bomb went off. So typically, in, if it's for rupture, you're going to pave, you know, arch to celiac. But if it's for malperfusion, uh, we would put in initially a 20. And then uh, if the malperfusion has resolved, we would stop with that. You know, if it's not, then you might need to put additional covered stents to the celiac, or you could use um, bare metal stents, or maybe you want to talk a little bit about the petticoat uh, in that setting as well. How about you guys? So, um, again, it's uh, dependent on the indication for, um, for therapy. So we're just like Chad. If they come in with rupture, we'll uh, treat them all the way down to the celiac artery. We don't cover as much um, for malperfusion, and what we'll also do is we'll do adjunctive pressure manometry of branch vessels to ensure that the malperfusion gradients have resolved uh, in those settings. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree with both of you guys, and we are aggressive with the with the uncovered stent for. So I, we, our protocol would be to cover a, a significant extent of, of the descending, depending on uh, indication rupture, certainly to the celiac, even a lot, even many uh, malperfusion cases, particularly with really profound pseudocoarctation all the way through the descending. And then we have been aggressive about um, using um, bare metal for, for a lot of the abdominal coverage, even, uh, even the iliacs, when, they're, when there is, uh, again, uh, true limb comp compression compromising flow to one side or the other will go into an iliac. So, um, Use a petticoat if it's a, um, just a dilation case, let's say you're, you're doing a high risk uncomplicated, um, do you think there's any benefit to petticoat in promoting distal false lumen perfusion? Because I think my read of the data is it does not, uh, to, I mean distal false lumen thrombosis like aortic remodeling, do you think it's better with petticoat than with just uh, covered in the thoracic? I think the, uh, my take on the petticoat utility in that setting is primarily to correct pr profound pseudocarctation. Yeah, and that if you, so, so it does work well for that. So on, uh, there are cases, in fact, we have some well-documented ones where there was extensive pseudocarctation along a, a broad length and that just proximal stenting doesn't eradicate it distally because obviously there's there's somewhere there's a secondary tear. Yeah. yeah, so so yeah. those are the cases that I think it makes a difference. But as far as your point about false lumen thrombosis in the abdominal segment, yeah. I would agree. Yeah, it's, not, it's, it's not it's uh, not it's not panning out like that. Yeah. And in, in which percentage do you do you see in your experience uh, that uh, the, the proximal uh, standing for mal perfusion doesn't um, is not enough to improve the distal uh, the distal perfusion? In some cases, that's true. The number? Uh, yeah. What percentage? Percentage, yeah. We're just a the thoracic T-bar yeah. doesn't fix it. The, the specifically for pseudocarctation? Yeah. Or distal malperfusion. Or, or distal malperfusion. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'd say, uh, well, I don't know a percentage. I don't have a percentage. But I would say uh, at least a third. You'll have a better result. You may get an adequate result. With, with just proximal stenting, but that you're gonna get an improved result. With, uh, I've been very impressed with how much better perfusion, and we'll even do that in a delayed fashion. So uh, example of a case where you have pseudocarctation in an uncomplicated setting, no malperfusion clinically, we'd send them home for a month, bring them, bring them back, rescan them if they still have it, and they've demonstrated some sign of claudication is a good example. And we force them to walk during that month to see. We'll, we'll pave them all the way down and get a, a very decent result with, in that set, circumstance. So I do think there's utility for these devices. One of the limitations to the, to the petticoat concept in the current era is the devices are, are first generation. And they're not necessarily optimally suited to achieve a better uh, false lumen thrombosis rate, largely because you don't get complete expansion of the true lumen to the, to the adventitial wall, so. But generally, we don't, at least in our experience, we don't see, you see some opening of the, of the true lumen if it's been successful. But what you see is actually, and I think it's because of a Venturi effect, you see a lot of more dynamic right. motion beyond your edge of your stent graft in the flap. And which is why we actually are aggressive about assessing uh, pressure gradients across these you know, branch vessels. But your point is correct. You can, we have seen situations where you can resolve intraoperatively what you think is malperfusion, even with pressure gradient assessment. And some patients will then get more active and develop um, symptoms such as limb ischemia. Mm -hmm. um, so we have seen that. Mm -hmm. It's actually quite fascinating. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Let's talk about surveillance uh, protocols <coughs> after they're in index hospitals. What are y'all doing for, let's start with Himanshu. How often are you scanning them? What are you scanning them? What technique and how long beyond even the first year? So, so within the first year, we'll, we'll usually scan them once before they leave um, the hospital. We scan them at, at a month and then at three months. Um, and then uh, once a year uh, if, if they're uncomplicated. If we've done T-bar on them, we'll scan them um, at a month 
um, and then we'll scan them at six months and then annually. With always with CT, or you use MR? Gen generally with CT scans, if they have renal um, dysfunction, one option that we have is using a non-contrast CT scan to look for gross aortic dimensional changes or MRI. Yeah, almost the same protocol regarding the timing of uh, of the uh, of the control, and uh, regarding the kind of uh, of uh, examination that we we use uh, almost in almost the cases uh, CT scan, but uh, in young patients where uh, you can see there are not so. Uh, uh, there is a good result after TIVA, we, we start to use uh, more often MRI. But if the patient has uh, uh, some problem um, uh, regarding the, the perfusion or uh, um, you are not so very well convinced about uh, uh, endoleak, uh, uh, we, we, we go um, with the CT scan. But we, we start to we increase the number of patients, both in, in young patients uh, or even in, in, uh, in patients with renal uh, insufficiency, we, we start to increase the number of uh, MRI. Last question. What do you all think the impact of branched grafts for, in the, for acute B will have? Is it a major, will it be a major advance? Is it a minor uh, percentage of cases that it would be uh, applicable? Where do you see it? in the future? So I think early on, I think it'll have a um, modest, maybe a little bit more than modest effect, but I think if you look down the road and you're contemplating fixing type A's with it, I think it'll be a big advance and you, you may see a huge difference down the road as the technology evolves and as we learn more about T-bar for the ascending. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, in our type B, acute B series, uh, I think about three quarters of the patients, the left subclavian was at least partially covered. Um, and so I think uh, certainly a single side branch uh, device would be uh, useful uh, there. Um, you know, if you're talking about chronics, uh, you know, we, branches for the abdomen <laughs> so, <laughs> are certainly uh, w going to be welcome, although the issue down there is going to be the la lack of a poten potential lack of a landing zone with dissection that goes into both iliacs. You don't have an end, an end you know, non-dissected landing zone. And there were things where people talked about the sepal cutter and things like that to make a landing zone. But uh, for acute uh, type Bs, I think, you know, the single side branch will be a nice addition myself. Mm -hmm. How about lumbar drainage for acute Bs? 100% for those that intervened on? 50%? None of them? Zero. Zero. Almost zero. Almost zero? No, we're aggressive. And the other thing we look at is we look to see where the intercostals and the lumbars come off. Because if they come off the false lumen, at least in our experience, we're more nervous about uh, paraplegia. Um, but I know Chad has not seen it. <laughs> we're aggressive uh, like the Michigan folks, uh, too. Great. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Great talk.